red test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Hello, if you're listening to the sound of this voice, then you need to be here. You need to be at hy V in the club room because, once again, we have great taste with great tasting things with Steve Boss and Catherine Dubois. There, I had to, <laughs> I had to get that right. And our buddy Dennis over here, man. Um, this is a bl- – and Mary, hi. Hi. Um, you need to be down here because it's always a lot of fun. 7 o'clock on Wednesdays uh, here at hy V, where – the greatest taste in Fairfield is found. And tonight they have all sorts of things happening, all sorts of things cooking up. I'm hungry, I'm salivating already. Come on down here, just get down here, okay? And um, I guess without further ado, uh, well, let's thank everybody. First of all, let's thank Hy-V. Yay! Let's thank Solar Powered Crew FM. Yay! And also let's thank uh, FMC, who will be uh, also showing this uh, rebroadcast. All right, now, without further ado, let's do this. We are getting to, here we are, right, hurry up, he's going, okay. Steve Boss and Catherine Dubois, great taste. Here you go. Mike Ragonia, thank you very much. You can listen to Mike on KRUU. Matter of fact, Mike Ragonia's 2.0, the only time I absolutely know for sure, even though I know that you're on other times, is after the replay of Great Taste, which is at 7 a.m. on Friday morning at 8 a.m., your show's on, Microgonias 2.0, so you can listen to it then. All right, I'm Steve Boss. Kathy Dubois is here, right? Yes, I am. And you said to me, I want to get going with my sauce right away, so come on, you know, make sure you introduce me right right away and so I can get going. So go ahead, tell everybody what you're doing, and then I'll talk about the rest of the show no, after you take the time. Oh, really? Oh. Allowing you, you, to do that. you are so kind. Uh, you're going to lose your opportunity because Ken Malloy just walked in. <laughs> I hope he brought some champagne. <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful evening about home cooks, and we have so much delicious food that's going to be served on this show. Mary Adam is here, and she's got some, she's cooking up chicken soup. What else are you cooking up? chicken stew <gasps> with Ooh. fresh herb biscuits. Mm. Ooh, yum. That is yes. great. And kind of goes with the hearty weather. We're looking forward to that. And Kathy, go ahead. What are you doing? I'm going to make a sauce, uh, a red sauce, a pasta sauce, and um, turkey meatballs. Mm. It's what you told me to make, so that's what I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it great to have somebody who will... <laughs> who listens know, to you? <laughs> absolutely wonderful. And Dennis Lopp is here, who's the catering director for High V, and you are making a family specialty that I had no knowledge of, and, and you said, what? You don't know what monkey bread is? That's correct. I was really surprised you didn't know what monkey bread is. Traditionally, monkey bread is um, balls of dough or bread that's been baked. Uh, rolled in butter, cinnamon, and sugar, and it's typically cooked in a pan. And, and here at the store, commercially, we call them sticky pull-aparts because you pull them apart as after you put them on the plate. Um, and I took it and twisted it up. And so to, rather than doing the sweet monkey bread that everybody's accustomed to, uh, we're doing meat and cheese, garlic, monkey bread. And so it's a savory oh, dish rather yeah. than a, a dessert. We will look forward to that. Now, before we get into the cooking part of the show, though, Ken Malloy is here, and he wants to tell us a little bit about an event that's going to be occurring at the end of the month. And we're going to talk specifically, after you give us the details, we're going to talk a little bit about the food because it, it's a big gala affair, right? It is. It's a big gala affair. It's the last Saturday in October. It's the 27th, and it's at the Civic Center. We are celebrating five years of the Civic Center being open, and that deserves a little applause, I think. And um, it's also, I mean, uh, it is also is a fundraiser to keep things uh, moving there, And uh, but it's really going to be a very classy event. We have... The, the 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 focus has been everything uh, local, and uh, actually I had thrown in my hat and said I know some guys up in Iowa City and up in Mount Vernon, which I had mentioned we could have some chefs come down. They said no, we want to have local chefs. We want to have this is what we want to do. So local musicians are going to be playing and so on. It's going to start around six o'clock. It's going to go a few hours. There's going to be a silent auction. There's going to be a live auction, but not a lot of items. But the items are going to be really fun. And people are going to get dressed up, and it's going to be a fun night. And um, we're expecting two to 300 people at the Civic Center. And uh, the people who are involved, uh, I want to really acknowledge, uh, they're donating their time and their efforts and their food. 
and uh, these people um, are all local. So we have uh, Vivos, who is helping out, uh, Yummies. Uh, we have Top of the Rock. We have uh, Shokai. Uh, we have uh, Fairfield Golf and Country Club, uh, Revelations, and let's see here. And Kumar, who is uh, kind of a – do you know Kumar? Yes, I do. Okay. So you know who Kumar is. So these are all going to be kind of signature bites throughout the early part of the evening. Yes. He's the rap guy. Somebody was asking who, who he is. Yes. And uh, anyway, so it's going to be a really, really fun night to celebrate our success of the building and to keep, its, uh, and keep its, uh, it, it going for many years to come. And there's going to be a lot of food at this event, right? There is. There's going to be food and wine and beer and good times. And, you know, it's really, uh, it really is a celebration of, of Fairfield. It really is. Uh, there's going to be kids who grew up here who are now chefs, kids who grew up here who are now musicians. It's, 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 it's really a great celebration of Fairfield and the Civic Center. And uh, myself and Christy Kessel uh, headed up the food committee. We also kind of took care of the food and wine as well. And uh, it's it's going to be a really fun night out. Is this a sit-down affair? Well, yeah, at one point there's going to be a sit-down, but there's going to be a lot of finger food and stuff like that. So everything's going to be small uh, plates and that kind of thing. And uh, we're going to have Bellinis to welcome you in, and we're going to have sparkling cider as you walk in. and pers- Hard cider? Well, no, no, no. We, we'll have some, uh, but we'll have some prosecco. And we'll have some bellinis as you walk in, and it's going to be—it's an elegant affair. But we don't want to, you know, say that you know, put on airs or anything. It's just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's going to be a fun dress-up night, and uh, it, it should be a lot of fun. And that's Saturday, October twenty-seventh at the uh, Civic Center. And what do you do for? What do you do in terms of people finding out how to uh, get tickets? I don't have the answer, but I would recommend uh, going to the uh, website, uh, Fairfield uh, Area Civic Center, or FA, FA, Fairfield, Fairfield ACC. FairfieldACC.com? Yes. Yes, yes. And while I have the mic in front of me, I just want to acknowledge this man for years who is... I, I, I consider myself kind of a foodie, so I, I love this show, and I've been a, I've been a closet fan for years. Did, did you hear what Kathy said? What? Did he bring any champagne with him? <laughs> I did bring wine, but no champagne. But uh, this man, uh, my passion is radio. That's why I went to college for, and this guy really delivers the picture over the radio, and I love that. You know, you guys used to cook all the time in the studio, you know, and... I DJ there. My buddy over there DJs as well with me, and uh, it's 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 just it's just uh, so you really paint the picture, and that to me is is a gift, and you just do it naturally. It's so enjoyable. People get it. You know, look, we have a, a room full here, but I've been here when there was standing room only. So, kudos to you and KRUU. Okay, I don't know who he's talking about, but that was nice. So, uh, <laughs> Ken, thanks so much, and. We will look forward to this event. And by the way, do you still need volunteers to help out? So anybody who can spend two, three hours helping out, you need them? Yes, and you would uh, contact uh, Laura Cohen at the uh, Civic Center. Or you can contact me. And uh, I'm going to do that. I'm really looking forward to it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm really looking forward to it. It is going to be a really fun night, and thank you so much for volunteering for that. And uh, if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'll be here. And I did bring... A special wine for you and wine to share for others as well. Bye. That, that, is, <laughs> that is incredible. Yes. Just to add on to that, Hy-Vee will also be there that night too. We are proud to do the, some of the wine and spirits, and we're also um, cooking and providing food for that evening too. So. Awesome. All right. That's great. All right, Kathleen, I know you've been waiting to tell everybody. <laughs> All right. Tell us what you're doing. I'm making a sauce, and I'm... Oh, that was so good. Thank you. Mary, now what? (laughs) Would you like me to tell you how I'm making it? Yes, please do. Tell us what you're making, Kathy. I'm um, starting it with sautéing shallots, actually, is what I'm using tonight. You can use onions or shallots. We love shallots, don't we? I just want to use garlic, which I'm using using both tonight. So I'm just going to let them um, soften. I'm going to just let them get soft, and then I'm going to add a couple of other things 
like uh, garlic, which I'm going to add quickly, and, um, and some herbs, and then put the tomatoes, which I've had sitting here with some um, basil, which I've emulsified in there, and a little salt and sugar. So I'll just do it while everybody else is doing their thing, and you kind of have a picture of what's going on. <laughs> okay. And what are, what's all this for, this sauce? Um, we're going to make turkey meatballs. That's right. You said that earlier. I just was checking again. Yeah. Make sure it was stayed, stayed the same because Mary crossed me up, you know, and I, I'm thrilled, actually, that she crossed me up. So, all right, Mary, now tell us a little bit about what's going on over on your end of the counter here. On my end of the counter, I have the biscuit recipe that the biscuits that are started, you start with a milk butter, kind of like if you're going to make uh, dough for bread, and you just let it simmer for about... It, let it bubble for about an hour, and then you're gonna. I'm gonna add um, fresh herbs, uh, powdered ch or baking powder, salt, and we're just gonna and the rest of the flour. And I'm just gonna mix it up. And you, to make them really tender, you just kind of work it out on your platter, and then you. This is our fabulous little cutter that we're using. <laughs> I tonight. love that. What is that? Like the uh, a, a Windex uh, yeah. top or something like that? No, actually, <laughs> actually it's oven cleaner. No. <laughs> Perfect. So we're just going to use you, when as you make the biscuits, you kind of just feel for the dough to make sure that it's not really a heavy dough, so that it rises nicely and makes fluffy biscuits. And then I'm making chicken later. And the chicken is in the oven right chicken now, right? Chicken is baking in the oven. I have found that it's um, you have a better flavor when you bake your chicken as to boil it in a lot of water. So that's what I'm doing All right, right. now. And we also have these absolutely wonderful eggplant. Oh, it's heavy. Eggplant. Look, everybody can see. Can we see them here or not? These are polpette di melanzane. That sounds a lot nicer than eggplant meatless meatballs because <laughs> because that's that's what they are and these were made what right well they were made by rosemary camp who i think a couple of people in the audience were hoping to see here that's not happening <laughs> but 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 we're really excited that she decided to share this dish with us not her recipe by the way but the dish <laughs> so we'll be heating that up a little bit later and then we have Dennis's monkey bread. <laughs> right, we've got his monkey bread, so there's a lot going on. We're also going to give away uh, a book to one of our lucky listeners, hopefully. And you know what's really weird is that one of the other things that we're going to do is we're going to talk about tips, our favorite tips for home cooks. And one of the things that I brought happens to be my favorite, one of my favorite utensils to use in the kitchen and I just looked and I just looked down and it wasn't there any longer and uh, Kathy Dubois appropriated it and is using it. I see, I, when I see a good thing I know it. Yeah, yeah that's so. I, I, I understand so we're gonna get to that in just a minute. Uh, by the way the book that everybody's gonna the listeners are gonna get a chance to win is gluten-free baking for the holidays by Jean Sauvage and this a book is uh, Jean's work for a number of years. She's been working on this, and it's being printed next uh, later this month, actually. And Jean's going to be on the show on October the 24th. It'll be our first opportunity to do our Skype video from hy V Live, and we're really looking forward to that. Next week on Great Taste is our third Wednesday, and so that means the Indian Hills Culinary students will be here, and we'll be having a great time with them. So... October 17th, Indian Hills Culinary Students, and October 24th, Jean Sauvage talking about gluten-free baking for the holidays. And we'll give the opportunity for a listener to win this book a little bit later on the show if I don't forget about it. Kath? I just wanted to show you what I've done na next. Time. What I'm going to try uh, do is caramelize it. And one of... Um, one of our, my tips in cooking, I think you were saying that we wanted to express what our, some of our favorite tips are. And one of mine is to start something well so that it permeates the oil, the olive oil, the garlic, the caramelized onion, I mean caramelized um, tomato paste, which I will then deglaze with a little bit of wine, will be the base to the sauce. And if you start with a really good base, you're at least halfway there. So that's one of my, my cooking tips. <laughs> She's always jumping the gun, isn't she? She's always out in front of everybody. Thank you, Kath. Well, and it kind of 
It didn't get the caramel. It sure it did. You know, we're we're really we're really glad that you're controlling the flow of the show. It's wonderful. <laughs> I see Jan Swinton in the audience, and Jan, I know you always have something to tell us, so will you want to come up and tell us? Jan is the coordinator for our local food program and also for local food efforts in 13 counties, or did I count 13 that? 13 now, yeah, we're up to 13. Will you pass it out? Um, we have an Iron Chef contest Friday. There's high school kids coming from all across southeast Iowa to the Indian Hills Culinary Arts Program, and they will be... Um, cooking, cooking up a storm on Friday morning at the uh, kitchen at Indian Hills. And so during their cooking period, after we introduce one another and, and the students all go into the kitchen, we're going to run a few little workshops. And so that's, there's a little invitation that I'm passing around tonight for the workshops. It'll be pretty low key, um, but it should be fun. We're going to talk about, um, uh, fresh, farm fresh eggs versus factory uh, grown eggs and what makes the nutrition different and how they taste different and look different. We're going to hard boil a bunch of them and look at them. We're going to also look at apple varieties that are grown here in Iowa and see how they taste different and, and where they're grown and what are the ups and downs of growing apples in Iowa. And um, we're going to talk about shoots, not sprouts. Tricky difference there. Um, the difference between shoots and sprouts is how you grow them. Sprouts are done in a jar with water. Y'all probably have done this, right? And shoots are done in dirt. So sprouts are a little scary. There's been a few E. coli and salmonella outbreaks with sprouts because they're done in 100% humidity in a jar and probably in your kitchen, you know? Um, whereas shoots are grown in soil, and so all the bacteria and the uh, fungus or anything else that would happen happens in the soil, and you cut them off at soil height and only eat the tops. And so that's the difference. It's a difference in nutrition as well because you cut off that seed and root portion and don't eat it. So you lose a little of the nutrition there, but it's much safer in terms of a, of a safe food product. So a lot of our schools, in fact, number one school for this project was Pence Elementary. It's just a few blocks from my house. It's a K through four, and we are doing shoots there this winter. So they'll be eating them at their, in their school lunch program all winter long. The, the classes are taking turns planting soil and seeds and doing that whole thing. So I'm, I'm very excited about that project. Jan is truly amazing. Please give her a hand because she, she really is. And, and I was just, I was just reading, there's a, there's a great book that maybe some people have read, you may have read it, uh, by Barbara Kingsolver, Animal, Mineral, Vegetable. Anybody read that? Okay, it's a terrific book. She, she's a great writer anyway, and now she lends it to this opportunity where she and her family ate essentially what they could grow and what they could raise as much as possible for a year. Mm -hmm. And she was actually talking about at the beginning of the book how some of the problems that we have is that a lot of our young kids have a phobia about dirt. They don't want to get, you know, their parents are always washing their hands off really quickly and they don't want to get dirty. Well, food grows in dirt. Oh, I can't touch that. It's dirty. Right. But it's that soil in this instance with the shoots and sprouts thing, that soil that really saves us from some of the dangerous bacteria that can get into our food system otherwise. And so that's one of the real ups with shoots. Um, so I, I always have to keep thinking through it. I always love alfalfa sprouts that's been on, on salad bars all over the United States for a long time. So I always have to go back and say alfalfa sprouts. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's sprouts that are wrong. Shoots are good. Sprouts are bad. So it's, it's challenging to keep up on that. Terrific. Indian Hills Community College Culinary Arts Program, Iron Chef Fall 2012, Friday, October 12th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. The public's invited free food sampling and workshops. And at noon, they'll be judging an awards to the high school Iron Chef participants and all of these different workshops going on that Jan mentioned. And there is a danger in a couple of these things. For example, if you've never had farm fresh eggs or you haven't had them regularly, regularly, but you eat eggs, the problem is very simple. Once you eat farm fresh eggs, you will never be able to eat any other eggs again. And I can tell you that from personal experience. And it gets pretty, oh my gosh, a monkey bread just ended up on the floor over here. <laughs> Dennis, it's a runaway. And I'm sure you don't want it because you're going to talk about food safety later. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so there is a little bit of danger that in that way, but it's it's worth the danger, I think. Yeah. And and apples, I don't know if everybody knows this, but 
Iowa used to be, I believe it was the number two producing apple state in the country. Yeah, and we used to do a lot more grapes and wine than we have recently. And some of that is a little change in the climate, and some of it was a little change in farming practices. There were some um, herbicides that the drift would get into the grapevines and just kill them instantly. Um, didn't kill the corn, but it killed the grapes. And so there's been some changes in the way that things have been done, and they're coming back. And a lot of the wineries are putting um, hedges of sorts around so that if there are farmers, um, they've got a, a clear tree line between that and the wineries and that has helped a lot too. So there's practices that we can all engage in to make things work for everybody. So All right. Jan, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Where are we, by the way? Let's see where things are go where are headed here. Kath, what are you doing with your meatballs? Any particular secrets you need to tell us about in terms of how to make these Quiet. lovely I just, things? Um, I just wanted to say that I've put the, the rest of the tomatoes in, and so the sauce is <clears throat> ready to uh, simmer. And we're using actually some, we're using some organic uh, tomato paste, and we're also using, San I think, Marzano. San Marzano tomatoes uh, that, uh, because they have a really great flavor, and they're not as, I think they're quite, not quite as acidic. Oh my gosh. Runaway carrots now, so. <laughs> <laughs> We're wild. We've got a lot of people here. Okay, so what I'm doing with the meatballs, I'm using turkey, and I just, I made fresh breadcrumbs today. Oh, hold on one second. There's plenty of seats. You can feel free to come in. It's, it's great. All right. <laughs> and I'm soaking the breadcrumbs in milk. And um, I'm going to add to the turkey the breadcrumbs and some Parmigiano Reggiano and a little salt. And I think that's it. Oh, parsley. And Fresh okay. parsley, yes. Yeah. Those herbs are really, really nice. Matter of fact, since you jumped the gun, I'm just going to say one of my f tips was going to be, or is actually, always have fresh herbs around, whether you're growing them yourself or whether you're getting them at the store or whether you've taken fresh herbs that were in your garden and put them in the freezer so that you can take them out during the winter. What, whatever it is, always have fresh herbs around because they pick up the dish so dramatically. Dried herbs are great, don't get me wrong, because dried herbs really have a place and uh, they're, they're terrific. But fresh herbs just have so much more vim and vigor to them. It's, it's, it's wonderful. By the way, that's Tom Allen back there on, on his music. Buenas noches, everybody. I, I missed that. Buenas noches, everybody. Buenas noches. Are we all going to sleep now? I mean, it's like, good night. Hello, we're awake here, Tom. Well, that's a little of my Spanish. <laughs> anyway, that was a little taste of parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme just tucked in. I love that. Okay. I love that. Yeah, we, we, we definitely, we've got some parsley. We've got fresh sage, actually fresh thyme that came out of my garden that Mary's working with, and fresh basil and rosemary. So we've got it all here, Tom. So... Perfect, perfect match. We, we appreciate that. That's good. And I heard a story. I know that Rosie Witherspoon was at Great Chow yesterday or today. Was it, you know, I, I know everything, you know, that's all. Did, I was wondering if you, did you have anything? Rosie Witherspoon owns the at home store in town, which is a terrific place, right? Yeah, really, really great. And did you have anything like, I heard that you were going to bring some interesting things back. Did you have anything that really you tasted that was so delicious? Golly, yes. What I, was it? Well, a couple of things I tasted. Some amazing sort of an apple. It was a organic apple um, vinegar thing that was a condiment. Like an apple balsamic. Yeah. It was amazing. It was like so delightful. Then there was this interesting flower from South America that tasted like coconut. It was, what was it, Kath? Mesquite, Mesquite flour that people use for gluten-free baking. And that was quite amazing. Tiny little, um, it was also like a miniature um, quinoa. <laughs> I, I see Ka Kathy is sitting next to Rosie, and, and, and she, Rosie is asking her for, you know, to fill in the blanks here, which is really, I love that. <laughs> quinoa. I was thinking like baby couscous, but it isn't couscous. It's the other couscous. And was there anything else I was supposed to tell you about? I don't know, but I've had that quinoa and it's absolutely wonderful. It, yes, in the little box. It's really, really good. So that's really nice. I haven't, I've got that mesquite flour, but I haven't tried it yet, but I really can't wait to taste the apple balsamic because uh, oh I, I, it's amazing. I, I want to tell you like 15 t years ago, uh, and I think they still do this at the Ferry uh, Plaza Market 
in San Francisco, there's a couple who does balsamic vinegar, apple balsamic vinegar from Northern California. And I tasted it and it was just like what you said. It was quite extraordinary, absolutely wonderful. So looking forward to that. Thank you. <laughs> Glad to see you here, Rosie. Hi, Steve. Ah, you know, I have my sources. What can I tell you? I don't know. <laughs> I can't, I can't give it. She was at Great Chow, which is a terrific wholesaler in Minneapolis, and they have lots of really good foods. They supply a lot of foods to uh, chefs all around uh, the Twin Cities area, and uh, really, really good stuff. And we use uh, things that come from there from time to time, so it's a, uh, and really good people that are running it, that have a good food sense. All right, who's, who's up with the next step here? Uh, Mary, do you have something? Just put biscuits in the oven, uh, and now I'm pre prepping for the stew. I don't use the vegetables once I put them, once I've cooked them in with the chicken, I take them out, use the sauce, use the juice, and then I start a whole new process with the vegetables that I'm using. So how long would you say this whole process is for the people who are listening and, and want to figure out, you know, what they can do, how to make this essentially chicken stew with savory biscuits? Well, I would say probably two, two and a half hour process, maybe, and it's a slow roast on the chicken, which is a good the chicken's the best flavor and then you pull out all of the veggies and you've got everything already cooked in your sauce in your juice and then you put it in and you can thicken it up with either a little bit of flour or I'm going to use some potato and I'll thicken it again just to see what as I go it's kind of a feel it taste and feel as you go because Emerald I, says you taste it and I absolutely love that now this is really interesting do you know that there are some cultural traditions where people don't taste their food as they cook it and some people even don't taste it before they serve it because they feel that the guest is number one and so you shouldn't taste your food before the guest actually tastes their food now i don't really come from that kind of tradition but because one of my tips is there are five important letters in the alphabet that are extremely critical when it comes to cooking food and those are t-a-s-t-e <laughs> and that's one of the things that you need to do over and over and over again when you cook because you certainly wouldn't want to serve your guests something that didn't taste good. That would be my take on the situation anyway. Yeah, I'm a taster. That's how I get it. Um, I am not frying the meatballs. This is the way my grandmother made them. She just braised them in the tomato sauce. So I am just plopping them in the sauce. By the way, you're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. James Moore, station manager, is here helping us with the engineering of this radio show. And we also have Jason Strong here from Fairfield Media, FMC, who's videoing this. And doesn't that scare everybody, you know, a little bit? No, you're all okay with it. <laughs> you're, you're always scared. I like, I, I like that. That's, that's really good. So here's one thing that we do fall down on in this show and have for how long have we been doing this show, James? I can't remember now. We just started our seventh year of broadcasting. So you've been there at least six years plus. Yeah. Okay. So we've been doing it that long. And we still haven't gotten this part right, which is getting recipes for everyone. Now, I think one of the reasons is that the show host doesn't use recipes, and that's one of the problems. And so he doesn't feel the need to always have recipes. So you have to listen very carefully. And Mary, I think, kind of you kind of hit it exactly right. You know, it's like it's a feel process. When I open up the refrigerator, it's what's there. I stock it with what's there. What I what I want what I like my likes are in my refrigerator. When I go to make something, I pull it out. My cupboards are the same way with the grains and the beans and whatever. Well, that's you just hit another one of my tips actually. By the way, feel free to chime in with some of yours since now I'm hogging the show that way. Oh, uh, that wasn't a pun for you by the way, hogging the show. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, the the uh. having a stocked cupboard. You have to have a great stock cupboard, and that means everything that you use on a regular basis because there's nothing more frustrating than wanting to make something and not having the right items there. And if you have that, you just have a wonderful way to uh, to move around in the kitchen. And in addition to that stock cupboard, you want to have good equipment. When you go somewhere, by the way, when we cooked at Janet and Dale's at our friend's house at Table Rock, there, you know, their stuff was okay. 
uh, I'm talking to Kathy because she said to be careful there. And I actually had Janet throw away a bunch of, some people have in their kitchens, if you have this in your kitchen, please throw it away. That is um, nonstick pans that have all kinds of chipped, you know, like the nonstick, yeah, stuff peeling off and everything. Really, you don't want to be, except, well, I don't know whether it does or it doesn't, TFAL, but if you have anything that people have used metal implements in and it's chipping everything, just toss it, okay, because you'll do yourself a favor. Uh, probably you'll do yourself a favor by not using, in general, uh, non-stick pans with those kind of surfaces, but there are all kinds of other wonderful things out there. Like Mary was talking about today, Emil Henry makes a, a fantastic non-stick surface that is really their, ceramic. Their stone pots mm -hmm. are basically I are basically non-stick. I mean, there's no real hard cleaning to the pots. And stainless is non-stick too for the most part if you get it to temperature. You have to get it to temperature. Yeah. That's a key thing. If you get it to the right temperature, it's not going to the food is generally not going to stick. Well, yeah, and, and you know, I in my kitchen, I'm a big fan of my cast iron skillet. I really like my cast iron skillet. Um, it gets you completely away from that nonstick surface that you know that is naturally nonstick if you take care of your of your pan and your skillet. And taking care of cast iron means that you season it and you don't sit there and scrub it uh, with uh, soap and uh, a Brillo pad uh, afterwards because that's going to ruin the seasoning. Correct, and and I'm fortunate enough. I I have an old antique you know, Dutch oven that's cast iron. So I have both the skillet and the Dutch oven part. The skillet forms the lid. So sometimes I just need the skillet. Sometimes I need the Dutch oven. Just kind of varies. That's great. So how about anybody here have anything that they would like to share in terms of, wait, wait, you're not on, you're not on the air. You're just talking to nothing. Okay, go ahead. Copper is good too. I have some copper pans. Did I actually have a copper as far as the conductive surface or the inner surface? Uh, the inner surface. I I think, I think it's, it's a conductive good. surface, probably. Yeah. What yeah a, it is great for that. It's very good, and you can use it like a nonstick pan. It works great. Yeah, that's that's really good. How, how Some tips that people would like to share? Yes, Shelly. Well, I would just suggest that people not also use aluminum pans. Uh, there is a lot of suspect um, uh, thoughts about it contributing to Alzheimer's disease, and you just don't want to have aluminum in your body. Your body can't process it. Same thing goes for your deodorant. I would not use <laughs> excellent antiperspirant because it usually has aluminum in it. Okay, now great taste expands into deodorant. Excellent. Yeah, so, uh, this this show has broad horizons, uh, but aluminum is really true because if you take a look at aluminum pots that I knew existed in my mother's kitchen years and years ago, you'd see all these pits in them. And you kind of wonder, hmm, you know, how did that happen and why and what's going on? So uh, it's, it, that is a real important point. Any other tips that anybody in the audience has that really feels like they would like to pass along? I'm looking over here because I know these two women are very, they're home cooks all the time. So there must be something that they think is very important. Are we still on the nonstick thing? We can be on anything you like. Okay, because in the nonstick area, I, I read an article, and, and it's really true. It said, like, in our grandmother's day, we didn't have nonstick pans, so you used cast iron or you used stainless steel. And um, one trick is first you get it up to temperature, like you said, and then if you go to turn something, like you're frying some chicken or frying a patty of some sort, and you go to flip it and it's sticking, you just give it some time. And then when the water cooks out of the food, then the, it separates. It's the water that's binding it to the, the metal. And so you give it some time, and then you can flip it. So I like that idea. I think that the whole idea of giving it some time is a really important point. The, the thing about cooking, and this is another thing that I wanted to share as far as one of my pointers, and that is that you've got to be present when you're cooking. That is really important. Cooking is not turning something on, turning a fire on a pot and walking away. It's being present. And being present also allows you to just really infuse that food with your own personality so that it's full of all kinds of great stuff. And that's, that's one of the keys to a good cook. Yeah, I have a tip. I cook and I bake. And cooking is a very creative process that you can substitute and put a lot of different kinds of ingredients in as you go. However, baking is a chemical process, and so you, you should definitely, you should mostly. No, those people who listen, those people who listen all the time, know why Kathy Dubois made uh, that. That, yeah. I can, knowing you, I know how it is. 
<laughs> yeah, you uh, you have to follow a recipe. You, you after years of experience with baking, you can do some substitutions, and you know for flavoring and various things. But uh, the, the the proportions are pretty important in baking. So you brought up something that's really key, and that is cooking. A, a good cook, if they have the proper ratios. They can do all kinds of things. There's a terrific book by Michael Ruhlman called Ratio. And there's an app for your smartphone called Ratio. And if you have that, you can do anything. You don't have to remember. All you have to do, you want to bake something? Go pull out the Ratio book or pull out the Ratio app. And it tells you exactly what you need to know for which kind of, if you're buying, if you're making a one type of particular bread or this type of cake or you're making this type of stock or you're making pâté a choux, uh, pâté de choux. Dish, what it was, it? pate au which we made a few weeks ago here. You know, that's all in there, and it's a magnificent reference for you. A great cook remembers all the ratios, but those of us who are not quite as bright, you know, we can use the book or use the app, and I, I use it. It's it's fantastic. Well, I just wanted to bring me back, to, bring it back to the dish, and and tell talk about what what I'm doing here, because um, this is going to go to the oven pretty soon. So, what I've done is. Um, and the live audience can see. It is the monkey bread. It is the monkey bread. Um, and basically what we did is I started with um, a good cheese. And I just chose a cheese that sounded good to me tonight. You can use any good solid creamy cheese. This is the Milton Creamery um, smoked Colby cheese. So it would be a good, good flavor. I have prosciutto. And I just take a little bit of prosciutto, wrap it around the cube of cheese. I take the cheese and cube it, wrap it around the cube of cheese. And then I have some fresh bread dough. This happens to be um, what our bakery made today. So it's fresh homemade bread from scratch. Um, and just a little piece of it. It's really, what, about the size of a half dollar? Um, and you just wrap the dough around the meat and the cheese. Make sure it's sealed really, really well. Because you don't want the cheese to leak out of it when it bakes. And then I just give it a good roll between my palms. And make sure that it's a nice sealed dough ball. And then I have a pan of garlic butter. Just sitting there. Mm. We roll it around in the garlic butter. Get it good. Get it good and coated. That's all you got to do. Pull it out of the out of the pan, and then putting it in. This is an angel food cake pan, but you could use a bunt cake pan, any sort of uh, cake pan like that. And um, just put all of the little dough balls evenly throughout the pan. And then um, just because I'm naughty like this, oh, 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 oh. the garlic butter is now going on <laughs> on top of all of these. And then I'm going to bake it for until it's done and and um i don't know it usually takes about a half hour it depends on how many you put in here um it just kind of depends but usually about 20 to 30 minutes 20 to 30 minutes and you have about halfway full of your angel food cake pan is that about the right measurement and what temperature are we baking on um i bake it at 375 um just to really get it um good and going but it, it will that dough will rise and puff up and make it more of a dough ball and by the time it's done baking it should be a, about a one or a two bite bite piece because what you're going to do is you're going to flip this out of the pan hopefully it stays together on the plate and it makes a nice little little you know presentation um and people your guests can literally just walk up and grab a piece and and continue on about their their event wonderful can somebody throw can you make room to throw these egg these uh, polpette di melanzane in one of the ovens for a few minutes and i somebody has to watch them very closely because we don't want the this is interesting because rosemary is from the philadelphia area we'll say and yes, but it's, I'll, I'll call it the Philadelphia area because gravy is what they call red sauce there. You know, I think, I think somebody who is from the South might be really freaked out if they showed up at a Philadelphia Jersey home and, and they were thinking they were going to have gravy and there was, you know, this red stuff that showed up. But, you know, this is the Italian Americans use that term. Uh, I'd love to, I have to look that up sometime to try to find out where it came from, but that's gravy, red sauce. Did you use gravy in your house, by the way? The word gravy? No. Okay. Oh, well, she's from Jersey and she's Italian, so it just and and you never heard of it? It's my I think it's South Philly. I think it's South Philly. Yeah, I think it's South Philly. That's the problem. You know. <laughs> What's in the dish that you put in the, the eggplant dish? Well, I can tell you some of the ingredients, but I can't tell you anything else because this is one of those secret Italian recipes. Do you know that there's a story and it's it's actually so, repeated so many times that that it's got to be true, and that is that a lot of uh, Italians, when they give out recipes, they always leave out something. You know, they, they, they don't share everything. And matter of fact, 
Sicilian grandmothers. There's a book that I have, and I, I can't remember the name of it right now, but it was about Sicilian grandmothers. And they they actually said in the book that this one grandmother said, oh, she never would tell everybody, would never tell anyone every ingredient that was in her recipe. She'd always leave something out. So interesting, interesting culture. Anyway, this has uh, eggplant in it, and it has parsley, it has parmigiano, it has breadcrumbs, it has um, garlic, and I'm not sure that it has onion and olive oil, and uh, that's that's those are most of the ingredients that are in that in that eggplant dish. I wasn't that sure. Right I saw it on the um, you know on your announcement that it said that these were vegan. These aren't vegan. These are these are these are vegetarian. Yes, these are vegetarian. They have Parmigiano in them. I mean, that Parmigiano is vegan, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you make them into balls, and then would they would be eggplant meatballs? Oh, they're sure. Balls right now, they're flat right now. But they can actually be. They can sure they can be made into balls, um, and and use them just like if you were creating a dish of of uh, spaghetti, and you know, spaghetti and meatballs is not Italian, but we. It's Italian American, but um, did anybody ever see Big Night? How many people here saw Big Night? Right, one of the best movies about food around. Big Night is the name of it. Magnificent movie, and the the chef at this one restaurant, he goes, he's a true traditionalist in terms of fixing Italian food, and he goes crazy when these Americans. It's in the fifties, and these Americans come in and order. You know, they want spaghetti and meatballs, and he's. You know, he, he serves them, I, I believe there's a scene, if I'm not mistaken, where he serves them some pasta and there are some meatballs, but they're not together. You know, one's, the meatballs are on a separate dish and they're, you know, like they're freaking out and whatever. It's a, it's a ter terrific movie and uh, wonderful uh, experience to, to watch that movie. It's a little sad for those of us who are foodies and it has, a, it has an excellent soundtrack. Yeah, Ed, I mean, Ken, you've seen it. And Isabella, Isabella Rossellini is in it. Yes, and also Stanley Tucci, I think, right? Oh yeah, yeah. He's the he's the chef. He's the brother. Well, actually, Stanley Tucci is the owner. He's the front of the house, and his brother is the actor who plays the monk. Oh, okay, okay, boy. Uh, great movie. So, so get it if you haven't seen it before. Big night. All right. What about some tips? You haven't told us any more of your tips other than when you tried to steal the show at the beginning. <laughs> Kathleen. Uh huh. Um, let's see. Uh, l I like citrus in my pantry. Uh, we, Steve was talking about um, herbs, fresh herbs, and I I would add to that. It's always good to have lemon, orange, lime, rind, and also I'm finding lately that if you puree a whole orange um, or a whole lemon, and and so it's you take you cut the very tips off the orange or the lemon so you don't have too much rind but and take the seeds out but if you if you do the whole thing it just gives such a such flavor to a cake or to um what else have i made even soups a little bit of that in a soup and it's really good so lemon is one of my favorite uh, lemon and citrus um and one other tip i think is is that the most important ingredient is love and i think that um just Acquiring a love for cooking and an appreciation for cooking is so important. Um, just realizing that it is such a, um, an, a way to be creative and it's such a way to serve people and to make people happy and to, and to have control over your own health. So that's my... Uh... Thank you. <laughs> well, lovely. And, you know, having... Yes. Don't don't clap too loud. It'll go to her head. You know we don't want we don't want anything. Now, Dennis, you want to share some really important things about food safety for your tips. Well, I think that a, a lot of times we we tend to do things just because that's either how our grandmothers taught us or how our moms taught us, and we do them just because that's the way that we've always done them. And we don't take into consideration that that that's maybe not the safest way to do things. And so you know a good example of that is taking like if you happen to have like hamburger or something in the freezer and you go to thaw it out for the day, a lot of people set it on their counter and let it sit there all day at room temperature. And it's not really the best way, you know, eventually that it's just not safe to do that. So you're better off to plan ahead a little bit if you can and let it come to temperature and thaw in your, in your refrigerator in a, in a cool environment. Um, you know, other things, just making sure that you're 
properly cooking your food to the right temperature, that it's a food safe temperature, and, and that you're first starting with clean and safe sanitized surfaces that, that you're taking care of. So again, kind of respecting your equipment, respecting your, your kitchen space, uh, all of those things. But um, just making sure that you're following the proper techniques and, and that things are cooked properly. Um, and that they're also stored properly as well. And, um, and, and for us here at the store, it's not so much the food that we cook that we worry about. It's really those raw foods and, and fruits and vegetables that people eat that are the leading cause of foodborne illness because they're not cooked and that stuff, you know, that, that it doesn't come off those items. So just really making sure that you've properly prepared the item, you've washed it, you've cared for it, and you've respected that, that ingredient so that it, it doesn't in turn make you sick. Thank you, Dennis. Mary, what are you doing over there? I am going to pull my chicken apart and put it in my stew. I don't want it, didn't want to overcook it, so it's like it's done, and it'll be tender when I put it in. And may I have a taste? A, you may have a taste. All right, I just want to taste it. Ooh, it you know, good. Just a little tiny That's taste. So Could you just nice. cut that in half? That'd be great. Thank you. Mmm, oh, very good. moist and delicious. Oh, too bad you guys have to sit out there and not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. Shortly, shortly, you gonna be there, Helen. Okay, hold on, coming back here. This is oh, <laughs> this is for Kathy. And have you ever heard about freezing a lemon, putting it in the freezer, and then grating it so you get the whole, all of the lemon when you're sprinkling it into your food oh. or baking? Wow. Yeah, it's great. It's really you can take uh, you could take uh, lemon juice even from fresh lemons. You could take the cut up lemon. You they have uh, a wonderful. You might even maybe Rosie, you have it at the store. You know where it's a little thing, just like a. It's almost like a uh, Parmigiano Reggiano grater or whatever, where you can actually just put the little piece of lemon in it and that's frozen and just right and just. You know, can you can just use the stuff right out of the freezer, which is wonderful to do if you've got that fresh, those fresh lemons at the height of season or fresh limes at the height of season that you you know need to save. You can't use them for whatever reason, and and you can then have those to use it all any time. The zest, or if you've got if you're lucky enough to have some Meyer lemons, you can use the whole thing. Absolutely wonderful that way. And I, I have to say that it's. That acid stuff, like Kathy was talking about, lemons, limes, wine, wonderful things to uh, really add layers of flavor to your foods. The zest One thing at the end. That I find, Steve, is like this time of the year, or just right around this time of the year, when the tomatoes, the peppers, and the onions are all coming due, and you don't know what to do with all of them. Just chop them and stick them in your freezer, no matter how many you have, whether it's one, two, three, four, a whole box. Just put them in the and put them in your freezer. So nice to be able to pull out a little bit at a time. Peppers just to throw in your soups and um, whatever you're cooking. Especially, you know, peppers are nice freezing to freeze along with your tomatoes. And I think the taste is much better still mm -hmm. if you have that local pepper that you've picked at the height of season and put it in your freezer than buying a winter pepper that came from who knows where. Uh, and uh, so, so I think it's great, you know, that way. Another thing that I want to mention is we, we talked a little bit about equipment and Kathy has my wooden spoon which I this spoon is I don't know how many 25 years old or whatever it's it's a Joyce Chen spoon and it's uh, available I know you can get it locally at, at home and they're wonderful spoons and this is my favorite metal spoon this spoon is a Gray Coon spoon. Gray Coons uh, is a terrific chef. I don't know where he is. I've lost track of him, but he used to be uh, many years ago. He was he had a restaurant called Les Benaz in uh, one of the fanciest hotels in New York, which I'm, I'm blanking out on right now. Absolutely magnificent place. And then he had a place in Columbus Circle for a while, also Gray's. Uh, you know, it was, it was something with his name in it. And he developed these spoons and he used to give them to all of his sous chefs when they would come on board. He would give these spoons to them. And they are just a fantastic implement for stirring. They're a great implement for tasting. They can be used for so many different purposes. They have a, a fantastic balance and just a really big, if you, you can't see it on the radio, but it's a really big, what is that called? This, Bowl. The, the spoon bowl is very large, and it's it's wonderful. Um, I got it from J. B. Prince, maybe is I think you can find it online. I think it's uh, J. B. Prince. I'm not positive about that, but I I think that's right. 
other tips that I think, uh, you know, we need to talk about a little bit. Good knives, right? Got to have good knives. If you don't have good knives, you're risking hurting yourself in the kitchen, and you're also making your job a lot harder. Another, another important thing is that you need to have the right kind of pots, cutting boards. This is all part of the equipment equation, you know, to have all, all that type of stuff so that when you are cooking, you're able to do it in a manner that's just the most efficient, effective, and easy for you. Because if it's easy, you're going to love it more and more and more. And since we have Avi Pogel here, who is an awesome chef in his own right, and Avi actually is going to be on the show on October 31st. Avi will be here. We're still waiting. Right. And we're still waiting for confirmation. Marisa Gujana is going to be our guest on Skype that night. And on November 7th, it's, uh, we're talking about A Field, which is a new book by Jesse Griffiths, who's a chef in Austin. And Avi is going to be our local, uh, assistant making some of those recipes and those books come, uh, true, I guess, for everybody to taste. Hopefully. Uh, I was actually just out bow hunting and, um, so hopefully we'll have something for the show, if that works out, if I hunt every day. Um, about the knives, I mean, having sharp knives is so incredibly important, and, and it makes it easier to cook. And um, a shameless plug, I hand sharpen knives using Japanese water stones, which bring them to a razor sharp edge. So anybody who's listening out there who doesn't know where to go, and their knives aren't sharp enough, and I'm very particular about how sharp they must be, then uh, give me a call. And uh, number? Look me up. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Avi Avi's absolutely terrific. And you know what? We've got to give this book away really quickly before we... And I hope I'm going to be doing this right because it's the first time we've tried it. So this is Gluten-Free Baking for the Holidays. And if you want to win a copy of this book, you have to be the first person to send a tweet. That's on Twitter. If you don't know what that is, you're going to have to look it up. You have to be the first person to send a tweet to pound, which is the hashtag, pound... Great Taste, K-R-U-U. There's no spaces or anything like that. Pound, Great Taste, K-R-U-U, and you have to answer this question. You thought it was that easy? No, you can't just send, no, no, you can't just send a tweet that says Pound, Great Taste, K-R-U-U. You have to know the name of the very first restaurant that was opened by the famous New York chef Mario Batali. All right? The very first restaurant owned by the, <laughs> you can't answer it. No, you can't answer it. And I'm not sure you know the answer, but maybe you do. You can whisper it to me. Anyway, the very first restaurant owned by New York chef Mario Batali, Pound Great Taste, K-R-U-U. The first person who sends me a tweet will win gluten-free baking for the holidays. Tom Allen, give me a second, will you? Play something for us. Thank you, Tom. Dennis? I, I was just going to add to the knife discussion that, you know, sometimes a whole set of knives is very, very expensive. And for me, I only use, out of my entire knife set at home, I really only use like maybe one or two. And maybe that's just bad technique on my part. But I'm much more comfortable with, a, with one good knife. And so take the time and instead of investing in that whole set of knives that you may or may not use in, in its entire... Hold on one second. Ken Malloy is walking out the door. And... and Oh, he left the he left he left the wine. Okay. Oh, Ken, thank you. And one more time, that's October twenty seventh, Saturday. It's a benefit for the Fairfield Arts and Convention Center, and it's going to be a gala affair. And if you want to find out about it, just call the Arts and Convention Center four seven two two thousand. I think is the phone number. And anybody who wants to volunteer can call Ken. Uh, look him up. And if you're from out of town, you want to come in for it. He's happy to uh, have you work. Anybody who's anybody's welcome who wants to work. Thanks, Ken. But back to the knife thing was, you know, take your time and invest the, the you know, you can get really good knives, individual knives, pretty inexpensively. And so take maybe just get you one or two really good knives as opposed to feeling the pressure to buy that entire set of knives. And I think it's really important, Avi, you agree to test. Don't buy a knife without testing it out first. It, it's just like don't buy olive oil unless you taste it first, you know. Don't drive, right, don't drive a car unless you've test-driven that car. And um, 
So certain places like um, in big cities, William Simona, Sur La Table have like a lot of knives, and they often let you cut them or use them. Uh, Rosie, you let people use knives in your store? Go to Rosie's store and uh, use knives there. And just look for the balance of the um, the blade, but most importantly, just how it fits your hand. And even if it's not the most expensive knife, get the most comfortable knife. But expect to pay at least eighty or ninety dollars. And if it's anything less than that, you're either getting a really really good deal or it's not really that good. <laughs> now there is a knife, one knife, uh, Victorinox, that Chef's Illust- Cooks Illustrated has rated at the top for many many years, and it's only about forty dollars. And it's 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 a big guy. And I don't use it that much anymore, but it is good if you need something to start with that you just don't have the money for, I think, and it's pretty good. Uh, I've only used a few of the Victorinox knives. I know that just the the manufacturing quality is really good, um, and they're probably less expensive because of the bl- the way the blade was made and how it's attached to the handle. You get into more expensive knives, and they're forged, and you can tell the difference by the bolster uh, and so on. So lots of lots of details, but certainly wherever you're going to get a knife, you know, ask them about them and don't necessarily buy the knife that they say is the most popular knife you know buy the most comfortable knife (laughs) you you just brought up something so interesting we should explore sometime because i don't want to get too far away from the topic but i love it when you go somewhere and and you ask somebody uh for example you know uh, you know what do you recommend and they answer it on a menu you know and they and the answer is well lots of people eat this or lots of you order this like i don't care what lots of people order i want to know what you recommend that's what i asked but and that's uh, that was an aside wasn't it all right (laughs) I just have my last tip, I think, for the for the night, and I'm going to change the subject a little bit, is that I think most home chefs need to be proud of what they make, no matter if it's, you know, really, the, the chef themselves really only know, unless it's inedible completely, but, um, but most of the home chefs at home really only know what's wrong with it, and so just be proud of what you make, and have, take pride in it, and and enjoy it and enjoy the process and i think that a lot of home chefs especially on your daily cooking when you're trying to get supper on the table and you've got kids that got to get to practice or whatever and you're rushing around we forget to stop and enjoy the process of cooking even though it may just be you know maybe a simple macaroni and cheese or whatever just take pride in it and be proud of it well said um one of the things that i think is important is to take some time to think about what you're going to do and um prep the day before if you're if you're having company or just organize yourself I think staying organized through the process but organizing before is a really important thing Mary we kind of missed some of the things that you were doing here and I know they were important because what tell us a little bit you pulled all the chicken off I pulled all the chicken off I thickened it with a little bit of flour tonight because I didn't bring my stick blender and that's what I would have Thickened it. Oh, did you? I thickened would thicken it with a potato that I put in it. Oh, I'm. Sorry. We have a stick blender here, Mary. Oh, well, I. But anyway, you know what? it's it's looking great. It it tastes good. As you um, oh, never stick great. your spoon back in the bowl after you've been <laughs> tasting it. You always got to have a little extra spoon. But it it's just simmering, and the longer it simmers, the better it tastes. <laughs> great. And it just looks wonderful. I want to thank you, home cooks for contributing so much to this show and I know that we can't wait to taste. This is the one thing that I always feel like the listening audience doesn't get a chance to enjoy are the tastes of all this food afterwards and all of you are going to get that opportunity very very shortly so thank you all very much and be sure to join us next week because we'll be right here live with the Indian Hills Culinary Crew at 7 p.m. on Wednesday And I want to thank James Moore, Jason Strong, Tom Allen. And most of all, I want to thank all of you who are here tonight. So give yourselves a hand. Because you've been listening to, if you don't know it by now, I'm going to tell you, you've been listening to the most delicious 60 minutes on the radio. That's great taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the voice of Fairfield, Iowa. Tom Allen, take us out of here. We'll see you next Wednesday. Taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.